Life Series Seminar for 2022. I'm Mario Mendez, a member of the Department of Law at Queen Mary and also a law alumni myself here at Queen Mary. This series was conceived as a way for us to nurture our links with our law alumni and to keep us engaged with each other. And we are delighted that alumni from all over the world have been able to participate. The speakers thus far have been a combination of alumni and QM law faculty. And our uh, we are in the process, sorry, of attempting to rearrange our April event due to a clash and hopefully we'll have something going up soon on the system in that respect. And we have a change in topic for our May speaker relative to what was first advertised in that Dr. Merkins, who is both alumni and a former member of the Department of Law, will be talking about the case against a written constitution for the United Kingdom. And um, the URL for prior seminars, the videos for the prior seminars and forthcoming ones is available on the QM um, Law websites and um, the URL should now be in the process of being posted to the chat function for this session today. Now turning to our seminar for today, I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Narissa Ramsunda, who will be speaking on the topic of state responsibility for the support of armed groups in the Commission of International Crimes. Narissa completed her undergraduate studies at the University of the West Indies and her PhD in public international law at Queen Mary. She's currently a senior lecturer at Canterbury Christchurch University. Her monograph on state responsibility for the support of armed groups in the Commission of International Crimes was published in 2020 as part of the Queen Mary Studies in International Law series. She has also been involved in the examination of human rights violations against minority groups in Asia and presented findings from that research at the United Nations Human Rights Council in 2020. And between 2020 and 2021, she was working as a visiting professional at the International Criminal Court in the pre-trial chamber division. Prior to her joining us at Queen Mary on the doctoral program, Narissa worked for many years as state counsel for the Office of Director in Public Prosecutions in Trinidad and Tobago, and in that capacity prosecuted over 100 cases. Now, before passing the virtual floor over to Narissa, just a couple of words about the format for today. Narissa will be talking for somewhere in the region of about 35 minutes or so, and that aspect of the seminar is recorded. We then go to the question and answer session of uh, today's seminar, which is unrecorded. During that period, people will have the opportunity to ask questions, whether by popping up on the screen themselves to ask the questions, or indeed um, just turning on their mics to ask questions without putting their video um, function on, or you can post questions in due course using the chat function. Can I just remind the audience to please keep their mics off during the presentation itself? So thank you very much. And Narissa, please do start when you're ready. Well, thank you, Mario, very much for that lovely um, introduction. And I'll move straight into this talk. As Mario said, this presentation is, in, it is based on work that I did for my PhD and the monograph. But since that time, I have become a bit bolder with a few ideas. So that's coming out in our publication soon. But some of these bold new ideas will be open for criticism, which we can definitely field in the question and answers. But it represents a little bit of moving from stage one to stage two. So I would like to start it off with just a collection of pictures that some of us will be very familiar with. In, in the first picture, we see a gentleman holding a tiger, and this was one of the most notorious paramilitary groups that operated on the territory of Bosnia-Herzegovina during the civil war in which Serbia had funded, uh, quite substantially funded the activities of this group. So this gentleman here belonged to the White Tigers, and this was one of, this was a very prominent paramilitary group. In an adjoining picture, this was part of a Hutu militia that participated in the Rwandan genocide. And as you see here, they are sorting through weapons, weapons that were used in the commission of that, that genocide. I have put two contrasting pictures on the bottom, and both of them are showing large displacements of populations. 
In the first one, it looks like a painting, but it is actually a photograph. This is the Rwandan. Um, these are refugees pouring into Congo after the genocide. And on this side, this is a very familiar one that we would be seeing now. These are pictures of Ukrainian refugees pouring into Poland. So the reason why I've decided to start this presentation with these pictures is that the presentation is not just only about responsibility for the crimes when they happen, but it is for us to acknowledge what happens post-crime afterwards. So we are looking at broader concerns with international peace and security that ricochets from questions of state responsibility. Now, it, there is a particular premise that I've departed from, um, which is that the recent invasion into Russia has been an exception into warfare that has happened in the 20th and 21st century, which is that this is the first time since World War II where we are seeing state-led ground troops in a traditional state-to-state -state conflict. Since World War II, contemporary warfare has largely been driven by groups of individuals who exist outside of the jury army formations, but they nevertheless rely significantly on states to support them via training, providing logistics, shelter, and general survival supplies. And there is a premise in my argument that under the current rules of attribution, there's a gap in the legal framework of criminal responsibility because the current rules, I will be so bold as to say, may not necessarily be fit for purpose because it masks a number of insidious and subtle forms of control that are equally as effective as let's say directing an operation in which an international crime itself occurs. So if I, if I wanted to encapsulate this paper into a central thesis, I'll say it as this, is that the current rules of attribution, the current interpretation of articles four and eight allows for state impunity. And this occurs in cases where states are exercising strong and very powerful degrees of control and influence over armed groups, but they are falling short of satisfying the requirements of effective control and complete dependence under the current case law that interprets articles four and eight of the articles of state responsibility. There is thus a burning need to reinvestigate how these operative clauses are understood and interpreted. And stay tuned for more at the end of this presentation, I submit two further suggestions that, I, that goes even beyond the quest for reinterpretation. The quest for reinterpretation is the safe space. That's the safe space for bringing change into what seems to be an unwieldy and weak legal framework. But there may be some bolder suggestions, but stay tuned for the conclusions. So why is this inquiry import important? Two things. If it is that conflict is marked by armed groups, and even if you think about the state-led invasion into the Ukraine, if we track back to the point of military conquest, it happened in Donetsk and Luhansk through supporting armed groups, Russian support of armed groups who were attempting to um, assert self-determination rights and so on. So the point of invasion, you could even track it back to early um, work around the question of state supporting of groups. I will come to this later. So any which way you look at it, the armed group, that is the group that fights without being part of regular military forces, incorporation into the regular military forces, they are significant and they are players. And also, and this is a thesis that was developed by Professor Kaur that I took forward as well into my work is that individual criminal responsibility is limited. And I want you to visualize this with me. At the end of the Second World War, we crossed the world. We had offenses that offended the conscience of humanity. And there was a selection of individuals who were deemed to be the most responsible. That is, you st they struck at the shepherd, not at the sheep. That is, you, you prosecute leaders, people who were part of the institutional architecture that, that led the commission of those international crimes. And there was a hope that if you prosecute such people and you sentence them, it would somehow lead to a deterrent effect in the commission of international crimes ever after. 
there is a myth, which I as well play into, that that domestic model of prosecution and sanction, as Mr. Drumbel calls it, that there's a myth that if we prosecute and sanction people, that is an effective deterrent for international crimes. And whereas there is utility in it, and it certainly allows for the narrative to go, to go forward into court and for victims to have their day in court and to hear that being, trans, that being transacted. At the end of the day, do we really think that parading a line of military leaders or political leaders before a court will actually bring an end to international crimes? Because there's a, a substantial distinction between a domestic crime and an international crime. A domestic crime is antisocial behavior. The state does not condone the wrong. With an international crime, they are marked with two common denominators, multiple perpetrators and multiple victims, but they are all integrated into a fabric of state policy so that what happens is it is part of condoned state behavior. So what we are looking at with developing a realm of state responsibility for international crimes is to suppress and deter international crimes by striking at state policy, finding a way within our existing legal framework to address responsibility of states. Because first of all, we have a wider range of remedies, cessation, repetition, asking for guarantees of non-repetition, um, asking for people to be returned back to their borders, surrendering people for trials, so on and so forth. But if we address it from that state-led policy as opposed to the individual basis, you are striking at the heart of that overall policy that supports an international criminal structure. Now, where we are at with state responsibility is that this is a very precise area of law and if there are students, new students who are coming into international law, there are a variety of ways in which a state is held responsible for, for, for an international crime. First of all, let us not use the word international crime. See it as an international wrong, because that is the language of international law. And articles four to 11 of the articles of state responsibility prescribes different forms of conduct through which the activities of an individual could be attributed or imputed to a state. Because remember, a state is an abstract entity. So there must be some legal jump through which the behavior of individuals could transfer to the state. The decision, the 2007 decision in Bosnia and Serbia stated categorically, a state can commit an international crime. So that was a big, big breakthrough in that case. However, a state could only commit an international crime in the eyes of state responsibility if it is that the conduct of individuals who committed those crimes could properly be attributed to the state. Now, under Article 4, it's very straightforward on the face of the text. It is quite simply that if you are a de jure state organ, that is, you belong to the executive, judicial, or the legislative arm of the state, any conduct of yours will automatically be attributed to the state. So let's say uh, a soldier belonging to the regular forces of the army commits an international crime. That's not difficult to prove on the basis of attribution because it's a de jure organ. And remember, a state is an indivisible entity. There's a unified um, state. So any organ, it will be relevant. Under Article 8, it addresses situations where if the, the, the entity, the armed group, is not part of a de jure organ, however, it was acting under the instructions of the state in the operation in which that international crime occurred, then the activities of that group could be attributed to the state. So what it all comes down to is simple principles of agency. A de jure organ, if anybody belongs to the jury organ, their crime is an act of state and that basis of de jure agency is created. Where it gets a little hairy is when we start to consider de facto agency. In that, 
the acts of private entities can be considered acts of state because the state has instructed, it has controlled that private entity to engage in that wrongful conduct. Um, the act of making those instructions or controlling the entity creates that agency relationship and it renders that entity a de facto organ. So that the responsibility for the state is thus engaged. Now, there have been two core cases that have interpreted articles four and eight. Now we are going to talk about those cases in a little bit of detail. And the first one is Nicaragua. The facts of Nicaragua to most of us who are over the age of 30 will be very relevant because it would have been live in the news when we were growing up. Nicaragua uh, is a country in Central America and uh, there was an overthrow of a government by a junta. And later on, um, when that junta was installed, the United States started to support um, rebels, loosely called Contra rebels, to overthrow that junta. Um, international wrongs were alleged to have been committed by the United States by Nicaragua, and some of which included activities that would, could be classed as international crimes. In considering whether the activities of the Contras could be attributed to the United States of America, paragraph 109, the dictum here, which has become very critical and impacting in terms of the shape of the law, uh, was uttered. And if I could just go through that dictum a bit with you. What the court has to determine at this point is whether or not the relationship of the Contras to the United States government was so much one of dependence on the one side and control on the other, that it would be right to equate the Contras for legal purposes with an organ of the United States government or as acting on behalf of that government. So visualize this with me. What if we were to break this down into a picture, it's a spectrum or a continuum. And on one hand, we have dependence. And on one hand, we have um, control. So these de facto agencies could only be, their, their conduct could only be attributed to the state if they fall on either end of the spectrum. There is nothing in the middle that would allow for degrees or gradation of responsibility as you would see in the criminal justice systems or so on and so forth. This is the unique feature of the state responsibility system. You have to exist on either end of that spectrum to qualify. But what goes further is that it seems on the surface to be a legal thing, but when you look inside of the dictum itself, there is a moral assertion whereby there's an assessment of where it is right to equate. So beneath the facade of the interpretation of the court and so on and so forth, that they're making brutal black and white, I mean, sorry, black letter legal decisions, there is an inherent underpinning of a, a moral assessment because there is an assessment that the court retains discretion to place the conduct at either end of this spectrum because it is right to make that equation with that group and the state and create that agency relationship. This was applied in the Bosnian 2007 decision. And even though the text looks similar, it goes a little bit further. The dictum pimps what happened in Nicaragua a little bit. And let's look at that together. According to the court's jurisprudence, persons, groups of persons and entities may, for the purposes of international responsibility, be equated with state organs, even if that status does not follow from internal law, provided that in fact the persons, groups or entities act in complete dependence on the state, of which they are ultimately merely the instrument. In such a case, it is appropriate to look beyond legal status alone in order to grasp the reality of the relationship between the person taking action and the state to which he is so closely attached as to appear to be nothing more than its agent. Any other solution would allow states to escape 
their international responsibility by choosing to act through persons or entities whose supposed independence would be purely fictitious. And what these italics are mine, why I have italicized it is that we are looking at certain key clauses here, looking beyond legal status, grasping the reality of a relationship and looking at to see the closeness of that relationship between these two parties. The plot thickens or dickens as some of us will see. What they went on to say in Bosnia is that high dependency is insufficient. What is required is complete dependency. And if we juxtapose this decision and Nicaragua, we look at certain evidential things that were considered in working out this idea of complete dependency on the one side. Complete dependency could come if you created the group or if there has been a substantial infusion of funds, logistical or any form of military point, uh, support to the point that if that form of support is withdrawn, that group, that private entity will cease to exist. Now, the only caveat here is that was that dependency so total or did the group maintain a real margin of independence? So I think, and there will be lawyers in this audience here, if we are looking at it then, if you are a defense lawyer for a state charged with state responsibility for an international crime, that will be where the, the bulk of your defense is. If you are looking to assert if there is a real margin of independence. So you are searching for real margins of independence. But in terms of psyching out this idea of complete dependence, these thresholds are very, very high. Because in terms of the creation of the group, in Nicaragua, these Contra rebels did exist before the United States gave support to these groups. But after Congress passed an allowance for an infusion of funds to the CIA to support in the military exercise, according to the case, uh, the Nicaragua case as recorded, the membership grew from about 1,000 to 10,000. So you are essentially looking at, you, you may not have created the group, but the infusion of funds, the infusion of training, it has substantially empowered the group to such a point that it could be a reckoning force in the course of a conflict. And military support, there are different ways of looking at military support. Whereas there will be direct commands for each individual operation, military support and military training also operates at a macro level. So there will be a general overview of strategy plans, ambitions that may or may not trickle down into the effective control of each individual operation. But these are substantial ways of supporting a group, giving somebody the know-how, teaching them how to do things, how to plan, how to administer, how to operate. No matter how strong that is, under the current interpretations, it has to be absolutely complete. If it is not absolutely complete, there may be a possibility that there is a margin of independence. The question to you is whether this margin of independence, is it that it has, is it that if there's a withdrawal of support, the group is incapacitated and it can no longer act? Or is it that if there's a withdrawal of support, it can still continue in its operations? If it is that there's a withdrawal of support and it is incapacitated, it, it may still exist, but it cannot go forward and complete the items that it wishes to complete, then is that not bringing into a certain factor into consideration on the actual terminology and how we are approaching questions of dependence? Similarly, control. Kimberly Trapp in one of her, her articles indicated that it seems to be a particularly high test that is being exercised here. And let me go into this in a little bit more detail. Under the interpretation of Article 8 that was consolidated in the Bosnia decision, overall, 
or macro control over operations is insufficient to attribute the acts of a group to the state. So even if you planned and you broadly structured um, the military operation and how it would be executed, responsibility in international law would only flow if there is evidence that the state, the supporting state, um, controlled the military operation during which the international uh, crimes occurred. And that has to be evidence of a direct command. That could either be, if we think about it, as Kimberly Trapp says, it could either be that they were alongside with the paramilitary individual giving the commands, or they were in some remote location giving commands via radio or some other remote way, but they were actually hands off in terms of it. So the reasoning behind setting this high standard is to remove any doubts that the members of these groups, members of these armed groups were actually committing these crimes on their own volition and having no input from the state. It is supposed to keep the evidence distinct and, and secure. So that, that leaves us where the law is actually at. And there are many policy reasons why the law is that way. And it, it goes to the simple assertions that we can say that I suppose it's, it's the same thing like criminal responsibility. If there are competing inferences in Dubai or Preo, if there are competing inferences, you will always opt for the inference that is in favor of the weaker party. So if an allegation is made against a state that it committed this international wrong, then the tests and the thresholds will have to be sufficiently high because you are essentially equating the acts of that group to the state. But these things I would like to unmask and part of unmasking it is that first of all, we have to understand and probably as a group think about this in the questions, effective control does not necessarily have to be a radio command or physical command. There are many, many ways in which you can effectively control something without physically saying, shoot him, commit that genocide. There are many supporting scaffolding moments that can be ut utilized. It is the same thing with the argument on dependency. Complete dependency is not high dependency, but how do we interpret complete? What is the threshold to which we are going? And in a way to understand these subtle, as I said at the start of the talk, or insidious forms of control or, or creating systems of dependence, you could look at the different motivations as to why states support armed groups. And this list was generated by uh, a lady called Belgian San Acker, who wrote a very brilliant book. It's not a legal text, it's a foreign policy text. It's called States in Disguise. And one of her findings from researching over hundreds and hundreds of armed groups was that there are different motivations for states to support armed groups. And for instance, the, the first one that heads off the list is, it could be a means for the supporting state to realize foreign policy objectives without spending the money or the time on having a dedicated policy objective to overrun another state. So you can support an armed group and you will be able to achieve the same policy objectives that you would have had from having a dedicated foreign policy mission on that, that line. There are, other group, there are other motivations. Sometimes the armed group may have an ideological connection, perhaps with a major religious or ethnic group in the supporting state and wants to imprint that ideology on the state in which the armed group operates. And in part, we saw this playing out on the territory of, the, of, of Bosnia Herzegovina during the Srebrenica massacre. So you have what she refers to as an additional connection. It could also be quite simple as what happens sometimes with the invasions um, into, into, the, into Uganda and the Democratic Republic of Congo. Sometimes there's a genuine will by the state to extract human and materials or resources from the borders of another country. And I'm not only talking about child conscription and soldiers, I'm talking about hard resources. 
iron ore, diamonds, physical things that could attract wealth. So beneath the surface of the, of the legal arguments, there may be real motivations to support an armed group. What we see playing out right now today as well with the Russian invasion into Ukraine, there can be sometimes the support of armed groups to assist that armed group in conquering one particular area so as to launch itself into more elaborate military strategies onto neighboring states. So for instance, if you look at the support that was given to armed groups in Donetsk and Luhansk, it formed an important part of the conquest because through that conquering of Donetsk and Luhansk, they were able to march into Ukraine. So if, if you think about it in the round, there are strong motivations for states to support the armed groups. And if it is that the court is asking us to grasp the reality of the relationship, then these motivations are very critical when we are analyzing what is control and what is dependence, because the motivation plays into an understanding of these notions. And that is because these motivations create relationships that are structured on the basis of a power imbalance. And if you are in a relationship with a power imbalance, there are certain forms of manipulative control that you can exact over the weaker party. For instance, there is a strong psychological dimension for control that would allow a more powerful party to manipulate plans, goals, and strategies of the weaker party. A mere threat that we can withdraw the aid if you do not do this, that, or the other. There may be other things, or like if there's an ide ideological connection, putting out myths, they will burn you in your beds, they will take your jobs. These sorts of things of psychological forms of control that have a very effective dimension. <coughs> Alternatively, with that power imbalance, it is possible to take a supervisory role in the planning of military operations. And you, you may actually see the state finding itself into a situation where during the overall macro planning of the operations, potential common criminal purposes are raised to the surface. For instance, and let us backtrack from international law to domestic criminal law. If there is a common criminal purpose in Anglo systems, if it is one particular crime has been planned, but during the course of that crime, a collateral crime happens. In certain instances where the evidence is appropriate, a judge is within his rights and the prosecution is within his rights to lead a case on the basis of joint enterprise so that they are all equally responsible on the basis of evidence towards that foreseeability of the outcome. So that, for instance, if you think of some cases where they start evacuations of certain groups of people in something that looks like ethnic cleansing, that happened in Srebrenica and it terminated in a massacre, genocide. Will that foreseeability then render a question that there is an ability to control within the creation of a joint criminal enterprise. Let's see it through the, the, the lens of a Germanic system, the Hintermann. Germanic legal systems, and a lot of the prosecutions at the ICC now are not um, premising uh, joint responsibility on the basis of joint enterprise, but on these basis, on these Germanic doctrines, for instance, where you examine the question of control through the Hintermann, that is, Germanic law doesn't see collateral crimes. If it is you plan one crime and something else happens, you are automatically implicated. And what they look further at is the idea of the functional, um, the functional perpetrator. That person who stayed at his armchair and was able to exert control through putting machinery in place for this criminal purpose. Now, the law on state responsibility has stared very clear of interpreting control through the lens of a common 
criminal purpose. Instead, what it has done is that it has said, if it is that crimes are foreseeable, et cetera, et cetera, it is not a, it's not a question of secondary rules of interpretation and attribution. That is a breach of primary obligations under treaty and customary norms. So what we see happening is like what happened in Bosnia and Serbia is that there was a finding that the state failed to prevent and punish its duties because they saw that idea of foreseeability within the context of you being able to see down the line and not taking appropriate preventative action. That may be well and good, but there is a big moral gap between saying someone failed to, to perform their primary obligations to prevent and in calling out that the person was not simply someone who failed to prevent, but someone who actively participated in that, uh, that, that international wrong. So it's, it's almost whitewashing that form of participation by relegating it purely to the breach of a primary obligation. So that the current interpretations of effective control, it does not take into consideration all of these implicit subversive forms of control, psychological, ideological, using a group to make a puppet state. And most of all, the impact of administration. When Henry V went to Agincourt, they were outnumbered by the French, but yet Henry V and his army won. And rumor has it they won because of the administration of the English army. So the power of administering is something that we sweep under the carpet, but paying salaries, making sure that everything runs tickety boom, that is a form of significant control because the management, if you are in disorder, that group cannot perform. If you remove that administration, it will be an inoperative, ineffective device that can achieve none of its military aims. So my suggestions at the end now, we bring it to an end, is that we have three suggestions, but two of them are very, very difficult. And it will be unlikely that these could be substantiated against the current framework. On the bottom, there may be a case to vary the tests of, of attribution and replace effective control with overall control and replace complete dependence with high dependence. But that would create anarchy in international law because the overall control test has already been rejected by the ICJ in the Bosnian decision for many policy reasons. And uh, if we even lower the high dependence test, we may affect that real margin of independence. That is the qualifying factor that needs to be attracted. Alternatively, a softer option is if we create a lex specialis for articles four and eight. And if that is something the International Commission would be willing to take forward, there are, for instance, with the law of the sea, there are lex specialises, lex specialis for certain forms of attribution. Would this be a situation that could attract that? And finally, the simple solution that I have put forward in this paper and that I would like to take forward is simply leave the tests where they are. Effective control, complete dependence. However, we need to have more searching inquiry into what is effective because effective control cannot, as a matter of law, be limited to just you giving a radio or a physical command during an operation. And complete dependence, we need to reinterpret that to understand what is the reality of the relationship and what is the effect of the withdrawing of simple things, even like administrative support. So that brings us to the end of this talk. I would be very happy to take your questions. So that would be it for my physical part now, Mario. Thank you very much, Narissa, for that fascinating presentation. So we, so we now stop recording and turn to our question and 